I've coached thousands and thousands of females in my life. And without an exception, if they come in that three, four sessions a week, 30, 45 minutes, hardcore, focus, phones away on the equipment, doing weights, there's no better thing for their metabolism, their body fat percentage, and I've yet to see any not produce the results that they want. Everyone, I got a very special surprise for you. A lot of us don't know how to navigate how to eat, what to eat, when to eat, and what's in what we eat. So the ultimate nutritional Bible is here. We've had weight on the show, but now I got Matt and I got the duo, and we're going to talk all about the foods that are going to help you reduce inflammation, increase longevity, better hormones, better brain health, better gut health. Welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. You guys put a lot of work into this. That was three years plus the 20 years of arguing we did before we started writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for those of you uh, who don't know, viewing, listening, here are the two founders of Bioptimizers. And this is one of my favorite companies across the board. We've been working together. Everyone loves the magnesium, by the way. Every time I do the show and the reads, they say, oh my God, I love it. I'm sleeping better. My muscles feel better. My nervous system feels better. So kudos to that. But the whole line is amazing. But you put a lot of work into this. And I want to start off with hormones. We love talking about hormones on the show. How badly disrupted are our hormones as a society and how much of a role is food having to play with that? First and foremost, a lot of women, particularly if they're on the younger side of the equation, early 20s, and you'll see this in the fitness community, is they're putting a little bit too much downward pressure on trying to get their body fat to suboptimal levels. And that in itself is going to cause them problems. And you see this with post-fitness competitor syndrome. And basically, you know, younger women need to have a higher body fat level genetically because that's supposed to be the time where they're optimal for producing children. Yet most young women today aren't doing what their mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers were doing and having kids in their teenage years in their early 20s. They're in a stress environment. They're out there they're in university, they're working their career, they're doing all these other things, and they're in the go, go, go mode as opposed to the home, home, home mode. And so that already is putting uh, an adrenal cortisol response in a different way than maybe their body was predisposed. Then they're under the pressure of social media. They're trying to get their body fat to a level that might not be optimal for their physiological set point or their hormonal best, and that's putting a downward pressure. And then on top of that, you're subjected to all of these chemical agents that are also disrupting it. And the more that you push down on it, and I'm sure there's a lot of ladies on there right now that are going to feel that, the more you're pushing down, it feels like the further you're getting away from your goal because your body is now triggering an emergency response pattern. It's trying to salvage something. Now, if you're a little bit older than that and you're starting maybe in the, in the, the late 30s, early 40s you're on the inversion of that where your estrogen is not as high it's starting to tank maybe it's easier to get a bit leaner but now you're having strange digestive issues or you're having hot flashes and you're getting premenopausal and you're like hey i haven't had kids yet i'm really worried about that uh, maybe you were using some uh, hormonal agents for an extended period of time before that uh, through medications so it's really important to understand where you are in that journey right now because what i think is easy to fall into as a trap is to say oh it's phytoestrogens from this plastic right. that's screwing me up people are looking for the one thing and as soon as you're looking for the one thing you are putting yourself in a blinder situation where even if you find that one thing you probably are setting yourself up for a bigger problem down the road because you haven't understood the whole picture. And it's one of the reasons why we put the book together is to start looking at all of the components that you want to address so that you get a 360 degree picture as opposed to a very narrow fo focus at a very narrow point of time. And that's what separates this from other books or other one fit, right. you know, one solution to your problem type of mentality that's so popular today that's truly holistic i've had a lot of women actually dm me and say dr g i can't lose weight i don't know what's happening i'm going to the gym i'm yeah. running i've cut down the calories yeah. i'm eating all the salads what's happening in the i know it's person to person but what's happening typically here what are we seeing there's about almost 200 pages worth of weight loss information 
inside the Ultimate Nutrition Bible. Probably the worst approach is just to cut calories too aggressively, too quickly. What happens is your body will start fighting back, right? Metabolic adaptation occurs, which means your metabolism is getting slower and slower and slower. But then it gets worse. If you push it too hard, which both Wayne and I have experienced, your body fights back with these starvation self-defense mechanisms. Leptin, ghrelin, NPY, which is a neuropeptide in the brain, your testosterone will drop. You start losing lean muscle mass like crazy, which yeah. then lowers your metabolism even more. And then you regain all the weight back and your metabolism is slower than before. And this has been shown over and over again, whether it's from the Biggest Loser TV contestants right. or all kinds of other studies. So what we recommend instead is you want to try to optimize your metabolism as much as possible. So there's a whole chapter on that and we can touch upon some of the key strategies. Mm -hmm. One of them, which is straight out of the bodybuilding world and Wade's a multi-time national natural bodybuilding champion, is you want to try to be as anabolic as possible. What does that mean? It means that when you're lifting weights, the energy requirements required to not just do the workout, but to actually build lean muscle mass. We know that lean muscle mass absorbs glucose, which is very important for your overall health. We can touch upon blood sugar, but also to actually synthesize a pound of lean tissue, the calorie estimates are at around 5,000 calories. So let's say a woman builds 10 pounds of lean body mass over a year, two years. That's 50,000 calories that the body had to use to build that. Also, it, it increases your basal metabolic rate, right? Because muscle mass is about 300% more active than fat tissue. So there's all these benefits to lean muscle mass. That's the first thing. Second one, which is something that is relatively new, is NEAT, right? Non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And people that have quote unquote fast metabolism have a higher NEAT, which means they're more jittery, they move around mm. more, they're just more active. If you, if you use a stand-up desk instead of sitting all the time, all of these things can add up for, to 500 to 1,000 calories mm. a day, which is a lot, yeah. right? So those are some of the key things you can do. Of course, we're big fans of doing strategic refeeds, whether it's doing diet breaks or doing weekly calorie refeeds. You have to be careful because you know, one of the best strategies for just looking at calories is look at it from a weekly perspective, right? We, again, from the bodybuilding world, people talk about your daily calorie intake. But what really matters in terms of whether or not you're going to gain body fat or lose it or maintain is where your calories are and from a weekly perspective. Were you in a surplus? Were you in a deficit? Mm -hmm. Were you at maintenance? So what we can do is be in a deficit, say four or five days a week, six days a week, and then one day a week we can be in a slight surplus, which means that we can be, again, just boosting our metabolism a little bit. There was an Australian study where they went two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, weeks off. Now the weeks off, they were eating at maintenance. They weren't eating whatever mm -hmm. they wanted. And what they found is after 16 weeks, one group just dieted nonstop, the other group was cycling back and forth. The group that was cycling back and forth, the metabolism was a lot higher. Mm. So I think one of the most important things is take your time. You know, we're both from the world of 12 week transformations. Right. And I, mm. we, we really think that unless you're dieting for a bodybuilding show and you have great genetics for that, which is a small fraction of the population, it's better just take your time you know, do diet breaks, whether for psychological or physiological reasons, because you know, to be in a calorie deficit requires a lot of mental energy, right? You mm -hmm. need to be focused. You're going to have maybe less energy than normal. So even timing that with the right seasons in your life makes a lot of sense. So again, take your time and there's a lot of strategies and you pick the right diet for you. And then focus on keeping your metabolism as strong as possible as you're dieting down. Mm. It's so funny because this is the opposite of what the 90s whole yeah. campaigns were saying is like, you go to the gym, just run just for hours on the treadmill, eat salads, and then that's it. It's sort of like starve yourself. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that starvation mode activates different things in our body, starvation responses, which are detrimental long term to the metabolism. I'm a product of that world. When I went to the Mr. Universe first time, I was in a calorie restricted diet for 11 straight months with only three days during that entire thing where I had a diet break 
I went from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. 42 <laughs> pounds of fat and water in 11 weeks because wow. I activated all of these survival mechanism hormonal activation points that Matt just referred to. And I remember being devastated. I've been at this for 16 years. I've exercised physiology. I've worked with the best coaches in the world. How is it that I don't know this? And so now today, we know that, hey, if you're going to be on an extended low-calorie diet, you need to do reverse diet. If you're going to go on an extended term, you're doing some of these techniques about strategic refeeds or strategic diet breaks are really critical mm -hmm. in order to manage that hormonal aspect so that you're – see, hormones are very mental conditions that it can't through food for short periods of time. So, for example, if you – Fast for a day is one thing. If you fast for a week is another thing. If you fast for 40 days, the same mechanisms that were self-preservative are going to be the things that actually can kill you mm. down the road. Mm. And so hormones come in as the, those mitigators when our diet's suboptimal or not quite right or things in our environment are pushing on us and that's a way of our body to kind of adapt to our environmental situations but left in a non-productive state for too long, that's when you run into problems. Yeah. So it's, it's like if I've been on a birth control pill for an extended period of time, there are serious problems when you come off that. If I've been on, you know, like I went into a fitness contest and I took a, a bunch of hormones in order to lose body fat really bad. Well, there's gonna be a, a, an extra cost. It's gonna pay the principal plus the interest mm -hmm. down the road. So it's like paying your mortgage with a credit card works for a while till the credit card's maxed out. And then now you got that and the mortgage. So how important, especially because there's a lot of women who listen to the show and they're so, I can't go to the gym because I don't want to look like a bodybuilder. Right. Just how do we just put in front of them the importance of you got to build muscle. Now's the time to do it. Well, one of my favorite lines that I put in the book is if we had a Bitcoin for every time a woman told us that we'd be billionaires. You know, muscle has multiple functions and one of them is that we can reshape our bodies so if you're a woman there's something called the golden ratio which is the waist to hip ratio mm -hmm. now the cool thing is if you're a woman and you start doing a lot of squats and deadlifts you'll build a lot of lean muscle mass in your glutes and legs and you're actually going to enhance that golden ratio which means you'll be more attractive mm -hmm. to the opposite sex and that is a hardwired thing that's not our opinion it's been well studied for men it's shoulder to waist ratio for women it's waist to hip ratio so women have that advantage where the more muscle they add to their glutes and legs the more they're actually attracted to the opposite sex in general very few women have the genetics to build a lot of lean muscle mass easily like even if they're trying it's very challenging yeah. right now of course women can tweak their training programs maybe they're doing a little bit less upper body more lower body because bodybuilding, there's that artistic side of it where you can choose what part of your body you want to build. And Wade, maybe talk about that. I think one of the big transformational moments that happened around females and weights was Terminator 2. It's Sarah Connor coming out and like, wow, you can have arms and muscularity. And it created a whole trend and it brought a lot of women into the gym is that, hey, I can look a little bit leaner, a little bit more muscular. I can change my body shape because the change in body shape, she went from Terminator 1 to Terminator 2. Yeah. Now, that's way before a lot of people's time here, so I'm dating myself a little bit. A lot of women put in what I call empty exercise hours, and that is they're leaning on the Stairmaster, flipping through their Instagram. They're on one of these really – it's not it, – it's barely exercise kind of things and saying – I'm in the gym all the time and I don't understand why I'm not getting results. No, you're not getting results because you're not in the gym. You're on an exercise piece, you're on a piece of exercise equipment scrolling through your social media. Mm. And there's a difference. Like working out is hard. And if you work out hard and intensely in a short burst without your phone, without the, 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 the distractions, you can produce exponential positive results, both hormonally, physiologically, building the muscle, changing the shape that you want on say three 30 minute sessions a week, as opposed to six one hour cardio sessions on my social media. And so you have to determine 
how you're spending your time when you're in the gym and what you're doing. And the reality is, is I've coached thousands and thousands of females in my life. And without an exception, if they come in and that three, four sessions a week, 30, 45 minutes, hardcore, focus, phones away, on the, on the equipment, uh, doing weights, there's no better thing for their metabolism, their mm -hmm. body fat percentage, and I've yet to see any not produce the results that they want. And it's so interesting how my, you know, hormonal issues go away when you get focused. Mm. And I think and that might seem a little harsh, but I'm not going to hear and blow smoke up people's butts and stuff and say that's not right. true. And it's the same thing for guys. I see this, you know, I don't want to just pick on women. I see guys doing this all the time. They come to the gym and they're like, you know, I, I, I need to get some need to get some gains like should I go on TRT or what's the latest supplement I need mm. I'm like how long have you been training for like three weeks yeah. Yeah. any guy uh, can put on 10 15 even up to 30 pounds their first year of weight training Wow now after that it's going to be a lot harder and it's going but that's usually significant enough to look as good as you want to look right and then the dietary stuff is what's going to separate the difference but that regular, consistent, physical hitting the weights because we are now victims of our own technological innovation. So our bodies work by efficiency in all of its production. So in other words, our ability to distribute energy in an efficient way allows us to live long, live strong, be healthy, and perform all the functions that humans can do. The challenge is, is we've taken that biological model and applied it into a technological way. So now we don't actually do anything that our ancestors did before. The average person at the turn of the century in the 1900 was walking over 20 miles a day. Wow. The average person was doing, they were loading wood, they were scrubbing clothes, they were carrying children, they were hauling, lifting, lugging, all the time. They were weight training every single day. And if you look back to black and white photos, you don't see too many people that were no, too big. No. And you don't see a lot of fat people either. So why is it? Did our genes change over those 20, uh, those two, three generations? No. What we did changed and our genes responded to that. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have a whole chapter on uh, genetics and epigenetics and nutrigenomics. And in other words, you think that you have suboptimal genes, but actively you can flip the switch to turn on the optimal parts and turn off the suboptimal parts. Mm -hmm. So genes aren't the whole story. You know, that blows my mind because you see old pictures and there's, dude, where's the people who are obese? Right. It's crazy. And, and sometimes I go on Instagram and I'll watch these like remastered videos of like people in New York in the 1900s or Paris and everyone is lean or you, you're not seeing anyone obese or even overweight it's just like everyone is active you can tell there's movement going on it's it's such an interesting piece epigenetics okay because this is this is important to hear because a lot of us go you know i don't know i i, I won't get that body i don't have the genes or um this food it probably won't work well for me because it just i don't have the genes it's crazy like we blame our genetics so much and rightfully so, we felt to like our genes are really dooming us anyway. But in this four and a half pound book, which has got a dent with information for genes, what are we seeing? What are some of the best things out there that are turning on our genes for the better? So just so everybody understands the big picture, there's genetics and epigenetics. Yeah. And they're both really important. So what we recommend is everybody should do a nutrigenomic test at least once. And it's one of these tests you do it once and it gives you all kinds of invaluable insights. For an example, I've got bad genetics for selenium. I've got bad genetics for zinc. I've got bad genetics for saturated fats. Wade can share some of his as well. So just knowing that, I can start to modify my diet, increase my zinc, increase my selenium, and of course, doing blood work or hair analysis or all kinds of other tests just to validate, but I did that recently, of course, I'm deficient in selenium, deficient in zinc, saturated, my 
lipids aren't great either because I've been in a keto diet overeating saturated fats right because I didn't understand I had bad genes for it so now I'm making those modifications which could dramatically extend my life increase the quality of my life so these are things that are really invaluable now back to epigenetics epigenetics are things that get turned on or off constantly so like depending on your environment what you eat when you exercise sunlight great sleep you're constantly turning on and off good genes or bad genes so for an example one bad night of sleep turns on genes associated with cancer like just one bad night right so it's always happening and occurring which means that we have a lot more control over our genetic expression than we thought previously, right? So that's what's exciting is that we can do, if we do the right health habits, we'll again activate the right genes and hopefully turn off all the bad ones as well. Mm. Empowered just by the lifestyle choices that we make, that's what I'm starting to hear, right? Yeah. Um, and sleeping, one of the major, major, major components. Of uh, everything. Of, of everything, right? It's like, we don't sleep well, but we want to do all these other things, it's kind of all for naught because we, we know how crappy we feel, but hearing about that epigenetic, turning on cancer mm -hmm. genes, you mm -hmm. know, now imagine a lifetime's worth of just not even prioritizing sleep. Well, back to even weight loss. You know, one of the biggest issues, and it's happening right now with the GLP-1 agonists, right? People are using semaglutide, all these, these different GLP-1 agonists, which are really an incredible tool. The problem is people are losing lean muscle mass like crazy. That's what's happening with it too. Right, which is not GLP-1's fault. That'll happen with any rapid weight loss program, especially if you're not prioritizing protein, if you're not lifting weight. So, you know, it's not GLP-1 agonist that's the problem. It's just super fast, rapid weight loss, which we've seen 100 times in, in our with our clients prior to them working with us. Now, the cool thing is with sleep, if you sleep enough, you're, when you're losing weight, you'll only lose maybe 10 or 20% as lean muscle mass as you're losing weight. However, if you're only sleeping, let's say five and a half hours, 50% of the weight loss will be lean muscle mass, mm -hmm. which is brutal. That means that your metabolism is gonna get slower and slower. And the worst part is you're not gonna look the way you want it. You know, and Wade and I have we've been focusing this for a long time and any bodybuilder will tell you this, People need to shift the focus from weight to body fat percentage, right? It's not about losing weight. It's about losing body fat and getting to that optimal range. And we want to be clear, we talked about getting too low, but you know, really the issue for most people is your body fat percentage is too high. Yeah. And back to hormones, if people lower their body fat percentage into the optimal range, a lot of times a lot of health issues will go away. Mm -hmm. Right. We know that if we're in a calorie deficit and we're losing body fat, our biomarkers get better, period. Yeah. And, and sleep, a priority of sleep is something that will help that more than we even ever thought. Yeah, because that first stage of sleep is where growth hormone gets produced. Second stage, REM, is where testosterone gets produced. Again, the, 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 the bulk of it. So prioritizing and getting great sleep, you know, getting to bed. You ought to go to bed before you get that cortisol response, that second win. Because once that second win kicks in, your growth hormone will not happen. So that's, that's again, really important. And I've invested $45,000 on optimizing my sleep, everything from a custom-made <laughs> mattress, a Faraday cage, to wow. like, you know, all kinds of PMF devices and so on and so forth. But I'd say like the most important things are completely blacked out room, cold room. And I'm a huge fan. And I just I was a huge fan of the chili pads ever since it came out. But I just got the eight sleep. It's another level. So I, sorry, I chili pad. No, no, that's what I heard. Yeah. Eight sleep is is my new thing. Um, that That's a game changer. And especially if you're a woman that's, you know, my, my wife's in her 40s and she she gets hot. You know, so now she can control her side. Her side is actually colder than mine, and she yeah. sleeps so much better. Mm -hmm. Of course, not eating three or four hours before bed makes a huge difference. And again, that growth hormone response, that deep sleep phase. Because you know, growth hormone will not happen if you've got too much food in your body. We know that, right? Growth hormone response increases as we're 
fasted, and so the longer we, we don't eat, the stronger the growth hormone response is. So again, don't eat three or four hours before bed. Take magnesium breakthrough oh, one hour before bed, fantastic. right? Or sleep breakthrough, which is mm -hmm. an, another one. And all of those things will, you know, really con con contribute to an incredible night's sleep. It, it, these, these are things that we can we can do in, in, a, in less than a week. We can have new blackout blinds. We can definitely turn down the, the mm -hmm. cold. If we can invest in an eight sleep or we can put it on our list of the things to do. We can get on that magnesium to sleep. This is so important because they're huge bangs for the buck. Mm -hmm. And something we don't talk about a lot is that second wind. And folks out there, I want you to tune in. If you're a night owl, like this one, I could be a night owl. Yeah, yeah. That second wind, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just do a bunch of work all of a sudden. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, I should probably go to sleep like now. Um, but if we don't stay up and we get to bed before that second wind, you're saying that we're actually bringing more growth hormone into the mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. So if we're on a weight training program, this is the most important time right now, right? Well, growth hormone is incredibly powerful, powerful for fat loss. So again, if we want to optimize fat loss, and also it's very anti-catabolic which means it'll help preserve our lean, lean muscle mass. And again, just really maximize our metabolism. So it's really, it's critical that we do that. One tip as well, like I'm a night owl as well, and a lot of it comes from the blue lights. Right now we're surrounded by blue yeah, lights. Yeah. And I just get stimulated. So there's a lot of strategies you can do, whether it's red light bulbs, dimming the lights in your home, which is what I do. Some people wear blue light blocking glasses like two hours before bed. Yeah. You need to manage light because again, light, is a really powerful signal. And of course, in the morning, we want to expose ourselves to blue light 30 minutes upon awakening, whether it's sunlight, ideally, or blue light panels if you're living cold, brutal winters like yes. we grew up in. Yeah. And at night, we want to, again, dim the lights and try to darken our environment so that our brains know it's time to go to bed. Oh, this is the, this is a big priority. It, listen, Huge. out there, you need to prioritize your sleep and, and in this sense of the things that we're talking about because we don't notice how much blue light affects us. And then we're up till 11 and we're like, I don't know, I'm not that tired right now. Yeah. It's because you've been on your phone, right? I notice when the sun goes down, if I put on those blue blockers, I'm tired by like 9, 30, 10. Mm -hmm. That does not happen if I don't put the blue blockers mm -hmm. on. It, it is like major, major, major. So awesome to listen to and just and hear it, that reiterated over and over. So sleep, big, big part. Now, when it comes back to these epigenetics, what foods, what foods have we found to be big bang for the buck of turning on the genes saying, hey, better for longevity, reducing inflammation, weight loss, even muscle? What, which, which foods have you found to be fantastic? Let's talk about superfoods. Superfoods, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's been a term. I think David Wolf actually coined that a very long time ago. Right, yeah. And there are foods that have extra nutrients and molecules that are really powerful. For example, spirulina. Spirulina has been shown to actually stimulate stem cell production, as an example. So to me, that's a superfood. Ginger, incredibly anti-inflammatory. To me, that's a superfood. Turmeric, superfood. Probiotics, any fermented foods, which again is an easy addition to any diet. I don't care what diet you're on, eating fermented foods, whether it's sauerkraut, NATO, kimchi, superfood. So adding those superfoods to your diet will help activate epigenetics. So that's, the, that's a, a really important thing. And of course, avoiding inflammatory foods. Now, in, inflammatory foods is very personal, meaning that for you, you might eat a certain type of food yep. and it's incredibly inflammatory for you and not for me. So again, there's a lot of people generalizing on social media and attacking certain foods because for a small percentage of people, it's problematic, but it's not for everyone. So I think that's that's something that needs to be addressed. But you know, anything that's inflammatory is gonna be mm -hmm. activating bad genetics, right, epigenetically. So again, we wanna minimize inflammatory foods and try to you know, give your body superfoods and nutrients. At the end of the day, you know, how do we become optimized? Let's give our body the optimal nutrients, whether it's macronutrients, which is proteins, fibers, carbs, fats. We want good fats, enough protein, fiber. But the micronutrients matter a lot. 
And I think a lot of people in nutrition either focus too much on calories or too much on macros mm -hmm. and not enough on micros. Like they all matter. The calories matter, macronutrients matter, and micronutrients matter. Mm -hmm. As a whole. They do. And, and okay, so when we think about, and you, you said one of the macronutrients that my ears perked up again because so much controversy around protein, right? And great, I got two guys who've been into the fitness, you know about the protein. We have some people that say, okay, it doesn't matter so long as you eat a variety of foods uh, that are, and you know, calories that you'll get enough protein. There's other people that say you need one gram, one and a half grams, even more to just to, to build muscle or even just maintain your muscle. Where do you fall on the spectrum of how we should be eating and prioritizing protein? I can probably speak to that as well as anyone because I've varied my protein intake probably as wide as and source as much as anyone. So I grew up in, you know, typical Canadian, uh, hunting, fishing, meat-based diet. Later on in my bodybuilding career, uh, when I was in uh, around 30, I decided I would try a experiment a plant-based diet. Now, keep in mind, I had been conditioned on the one gram per pound of body weight. That was the gold standard in bodybuilding fitness. That was the science. And I recognized, well, is that really true? And let's be clear about one thing around protein. What is its number or first advantage is satiety. Protein makes you feel full. Second thing is it takes a lot of energy to metabolize mm. protein. And so there's a thermogenic effect to that. In other words, a, a calorie of protein versus a calorie of carbohydrate, which are four grams each, you'll get fatter on four grams on, on you know, the same amount of carbohydrates than you will on protein. Simple. It's just simple that way. But that led me to think about another aspect is, well, how, mu how much protein do you really need? You don't really need protein, you need amino acids. Now, the amount of amino acids that you are going to deliver in your system is directly correlated to how well your digestive system is working. Your digestive system, as we talked about, I think, on the last podcast, is you got five stages of digestion. And, you know, how you taste, touch, prepare the food, the environment that you're setting for that, that puts you in a, the right hormonal state. Then you're masticating it, chewing it, taking your time. Then it goes into the upper cardiac portion of the stomach. Mm -hmm. Okay, at that stage, that's when the natural enzymes present are supposed to be breaking it down. Most people eat cooked food, so that's different for humans. That's why we advocate supplementing enzymes relative to the dietary strategy that works for you. We've built enzyme formulations for yeah, every yeah. Virtu virtually every diet yeah. strategy. Then you have hydrochloric acid. And usually when you're younger, that's not much of an issue. But as you get older, insufficient hydrochloric acid is a bigger problem than people might imagine. And probably for most bang for their buck, if you've got digestive issues, hydrochloric acid tas tablets after, after a meal is just money. Mm -hmm. And then you've got your state of your microbiome, your probiotics, you know, and, and you know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if you have a dysbiosis, you have too many bad guys, they're gonna use that protein and create indole and skate all, all these toxic chemicals that make you have brain fog in the morning. So if you're waking up with brain fog in the morning and crusty eyes and have a trouble getting going, there's yeah. probably a disbalance there. Um, if you're feeling foods that really disrupt you, you probably have suboptimal bacteria for that particular diet. So Matt and I, even though we advocate the strategies inside the book, he's a keto guy, I'm a plant-based guy. Our microbiomes are virtually wow. completely different, yet we take advantage of some of the same probiotics to optimize our diets because there are key probiotics, like p 3 om is one of the probiotics we developed, which breaks down protein and converts it to amino acids. So the state of your digestive system is going to determine how much protein. So going back to 2003, Leading up to that, I'm eating 250 grams of protein a day over five meals and end up blowing myself up. I fix my microbiome over the next six months and then I started to systematically see how much protein did I actually need when I had an optimized digestive system. And I went down to 85 grams just four years later and was able to maintain the same amount of muscle mass competing at a national and world championships. So 
I knew that, okay, I had very specific parameters. And so I systematically found. Now, as I get older, I prefer to have a little bit more protein than that because I like the satiety factor mm -hmm. and I stack it with fiber. Uh, being a plant-based guy now, I can't, it's, it's a lot harder for a plant-based person to get more protein. So then you've got to really be conscientious of your fiber to keep your satiety. Again, I have suboptimal genes for satiety left of my own design. I am just going to overeat period. Mm -hmm. Um, because I have a delayed response to feeling full. Some people eat a little bit and they yeah. feel full, right? They, you know, they need that they're a nibbler where I'm like, I can eat 5,000 calories in a, in a 30 minute session. And it's like, yeah, let's do more because <laughs> I haven't hit the signal. There's no signal yeah. going on my brain to stop. Yeah. And so what Matt, um, spoke about earlier about getting a genetic test. Once you have that genetic test, you're going to see that, okay, I have suboptimal genes, maybe on blood sugar regulation, maybe on satiety, maybe on fats, maybe on carbohydrates, whatever it happens to be. Now you can say, okay, based on these things, how do I design a diet strategy that is going to address my suboptimal genetics mm -hmm. so I don't get myself in trouble? And when you do that, it's a complete game changer. It took us 20 years to figure this stuff out that you can figure out, you know, in uh, 20 days from after getting your test, sending a test swab in and getting the results back and reading through this and going, oh, now I need to know. This is the better diet. It's better for me to go keto than it would be on a plant-based diet. Or, you know what, it fits your macros is perfect for me. Hmm. And I love that you both are really putting that on really high for us to do is go get a nutrigenomics test. And, and, and see what's going on, where you're deficient, and it'll personalize, all, you know, yeah. it takes all the talking heads off Instagram, like, like me or my colleagues saying, eat this, you have to eat this. No, instead, what does your body want? And this is actually what I'm a huge advocate is like, you have to work with your body because your body, my body and your body are very different, especially when it comes to our microbiome, which is exactly what you were saying. And mm -hmm. it's incredible to think how you can shift your microbiome and then your protein needs go down. Yep. No one really is talking about that. I want to go back to protein. There's a couple of really important points and I'm going to tie it back to hormones as well. It's a lot of people that don't have good genetics for fasting. Their cortisol response gets too high. Their cortisol gets out of whack and their cortisol to DHEA ratio gets thrown way off, especially people with Mediterranean genetics, right? Because again, these people grew up with an abundance of food all the time compared to northern european genetics like wade and i where we had to or our ancestors had to survive long hard yeah. brutal brutal winters so for an example you might not have great genetics for fasting and we you know i i thrive on fasting i can do a lot of five-day fasts and, and do well mm. now a lot of people have been doing intermittent fasting and there's been a lot of people like Peter Tia, Tim Ferriss, other people that are saying, I had to stop because I'm losing too much lean muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an important, there's a, an obvious reason why that's occurring, and that is mTOR activation. So we know that if we eat protein and we get three grams of leucine, mTOR, which is really anabolic, gets triggered. So if you're not eating if you're only eating, let's say, once or twice a day compared to, let's say, four feedings, which is typically what we'd recommend, you're getting a fraction of the anabolic response compared to eating four times a day. Now, intermittent fasting can be a tool, can be an, a good tool. We have a whole chapter on fasting. And the number one advantage to intermittent fasting is ghrelin shifting. Mm. So we know that an hour before a typical mealtime, our bodies release ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone that makes us hungry in anticipation for the meal that's coming. So when you when you start doing intermittent fasting, you're gonna be hungry, let's say you skip breakfast, you're gonna be hungry for three, four, five days, and then your ghrelin response will actually stop, so it makes it easier for people to lower their overall calories. And that's the magic, if you will, in intermittent fasting, is it's a tool to make calorie management easier, and if, if that works for people, great. But we just want people to be aware that they might start losing lean muscle mass, especially if they're not lifting weights, if they're not, you know, again, getting that mTOR activation, if they're not getting enough great sleep, 
-hmm. So again, there's always this dance in the body between anabolism and catabolism, where our body's either building or breaking down. And what we want to do is try to maximize the anabolism and minimize the catabolism. And that's really how you preserve your lean muscle mass as you're losing weight. And that's how you really maximize your metabolism. Mm. It's funny because uh, maybe two years ago, they said, everyone needs to fast right now and mm -hmm. we need to do it for a long time. And then now people are like scaling back a little bit. Um, but it, it's always awesome to hear the wisdom of like kind of what we're seeing in the body genetically. We're talking about mTOR, talking about leucine, all these mm -hmm. things that how do we, okay, how do we, if we're gonna fast, we have to actually keep these things in mind. Which begs me to the next question. A lot of uh, people are saying women and men shouldn't be fasting the same way. And there's a lot of studies that were done on the fasting. I believe it was almost exclusively on men. Or, or it, so we, we're extrapolating this information for women. Should women be fasting? Do we know anything about how long they should or could? And can it affect their hormones? Yeah, so I work with a, a, a lot of female-centric professionals and who use fasting. They're high-output women who have a – I think there's a predetermination that they – really like fasting a little bit um, almost all of them do better by eating early in the day and fasting after like 3 4 p.m. and then going on to the next day where men will often be the inverse they're better to fast in the mornings and hit their eating later in the day and that's because of the hormonal cycle again if a woman doesn't have food as regularly it can trigger adrenaline cortisol response and if you have too much cortisol inside of the body this is where you have that puffy look that you don't ever seem to get in shape right and I know for myself I'm very sensitive to adrenaline and cortisol I like stimulants I, I really do I like I like coffee I drink one I want more you know uh, nootropics if I, I have some I want more I love that stimulating effect but I also know it trips me over and will create a cortisol response where I'll hold weight right in my belly. Mm. It's, it's, it's so, and it's, I can literally look at myself in the mirror in the morning and I can tell you, yeah, wait, you gotta back off the coffees for a while or you gotta do that because all of a sudden I have this puffy, pushed out belly look as opposed to if I'm not doing that, I notice, oh, I haven't changed my diet a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, fasting, again, you're going to have to see if you have the genes that are for fasting. I do, I do really well on fasting. So for me, because of the two aspects of feasting and fasting, I like to implement a 36 to 48 hour fast once per week. So usually that fast, I'll start maybe Sunday afternoon, for example. I'll have a big meal Sunday afternoon and then not eat until Tuesday morning. Sometimes I'll just end it Sunday night, mm -hmm. not eat till Tuesday morning. Yeah. Now, that's usually correlative to what's my fast or what's my feasting component. Because again, that overeating guy, yeah. I, I need to feed that beast as well. So I like to have once a week where I jack my calories up, you know, 50 to actually be more than that, but a hundred percent more than my daily intake. Mm -hmm. So I have my friends over. It's Saturday night. There's a big UFC fight or something right, like that. Right, so, right. you know, and you get the adrenaline going and the cortisol yeah, yeah. and I'm just knocking <laughs> back chips and having a great time and drinking yeah. kombuchas and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, high-fiving each yeah. other and I'm up way later than I normally yes. am. And then so that's when I do that reset. Next day, don't eat that much. Have that really good, healthy lunch. And then I'll fast out of that and let my body enough time to mm -hmm. metabolize those calories until I go back to my steady routine, mm -hmm. which is right at, uh, at maintenance uh, for the rest of the days. And that's, that's a, that took me years to figure that out. With the information in the book, you can figure that out in just a few chapters of information. Oh, amazing stuff, and, it, and it's dense with all of it. I, I'm just, I'm so fascinated how both of you are so tuned in with your bodies, right? Like, there's people who just wake up puffy and they're like, I don't know why I'm like this. Right. But, you figured out that it's caffeine and you know and it and, it, and it's pretty it's pretty fascinating how this is i know it's your guys passion so of course like you're, yeah. you're gonna want to know but um we're all seeing that in the book 
Very, very important. Are there any foods, and we are living in a stress society, man. Mm -hmm. we, we know that. We are on the go. Not only the chemical stresses, which we talk about toxins all the time, the physical stressors. We have the, the light, the blue light we were talking about. What, aside from a good sleep, are, are there any foods out there that are going to help mitigate the stress, help actually balance that cortisol, that adrenaline? Are there any things that help really, really make our body more robust towards stress? <laughs> First of all, everybody on some level is a stress eater. Stress mm -hmm. eater. Right? Yeah. I mean, we all stress eat to some degree. Some people, you know, I have a, a good friend who's, uh, again, he's very clear he's a food addict, you know, and he struggles with that and that's been a big issue so that's kind of a, an extreme version of that but on some level even people who stay fit a lot of people work out so that they can eat yeah <laughs> right mm -hmm. i mean i'm one of those guys I mean, if, <laughs> yeah. I, if i didn't work out my this would be this would be a disaster yeah, this is... yeah so anyways I, my point is on some level we're all stress eaters and the reason is that when we eat carbohydrates we get a serotonin response and mm -hmm. serotonin helps stabilize our mood and our brains we feel calmer. Also, when you eat, especially hyper palatable foods, like things that are just super tasty, filled with sugar, salt, fats, you name it, plus all the flavoring, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's food scientists that their only job is to make the food as addictive as humanly possible. Yeah. That is literally their job description, right? So when you eat those foods, there's a massive dopamine response as well. So you're getting serotonin, you're getting dopamine, and that is one of the reasons why food is so addictive, right? I mean, we're getting that heroin-like response when we eat sugar and fats together. Now, Not to mention the social connection that's often tied around events. Yeah, so mm -hmm. now we're getting oxytocin on top of that. Right. So serotonin, oxytocin. So we're getting this, this chemical cocktail that makes food incredibly, I think just addictive in general. And of course, you know, for now we got Uber Eats, we push a button. Oh. We get hyper palatable food delivered to your house in 15, oh. 20 minutes. So, again, people are just over consuming hyper palatable foods and not moving enough. I mean, that's why there's an obesity epidemic, right? On average, people are eating about 2,700 calories a day. Sorry, they're burning about 2,700 calories, consuming around 3,500 calories. Those are the averages. So, most people are in about a seven, 800 calorie surplus on a daily basis. But back to your question, um, I think eating carbohydrates and again i'm a keto guy i like to eat a little bit of carbs like about an hour before bed i find it calms me down because even when i fast if i do a multi-day fast my sleep will start getting wrecked on day three day four day five so what i've done to counter that is i'll i'll eat about like half a cup of pineapple or a teaspoon of honey any just a little bit of carbohydrates and it really seems to calm my nervous system down mm. of course magnesium rich foods or just taking magnesium breakthrough is phenomenal yeah. to help lower or manage the stress response mm. anything that's got GABA in it valerian root you know chamomile of course is another good one so there's a lot of teas or different things we can drink or consume that'll help calm our nervous system down and help us get better sleep yeah my favorites still and i is dark chocolate mm -hmm. I, I think if there's a if there's a superfood Mm -hmm. dark chocolate is the winner and mm -hmm. something i've noticed is people who crave a lot of chocolate are usually magnesium deficient and what's interesting is if you're a high caffeine consumer that also is suboptimal for magnesium absorption so a lot of times we have the people who are taking the coffee in the morning stimulating the system they may have suboptimal genes for magnesium intake they're in a high EMF environment, getting exposed, it's putting stress on the, the molecules. They're eating a lot of calcium-based products. In North America, we have high levels of calcium, very low levels of magnesium. So you're pounding all this calcium, and it's a two-to-one ratio for calcium and magnesium. Now you're dropping your mineral, your body's going to start dropping, dumping calcium out of your bones to try and stabilize that ratio. And... I was just listening to a lady the other day, and, she, and this happens, you go to a place like OsteoStrong, which is dealing particularly with osteopenia and osteoporosis. And for females, this is a massive thing. Every female needs to understand that when, you're, uh, when you get premenopausal, 
or menopausal, the loss in bone mass can be exponentially bad, especially if you don't have these key minerals worked out in your diet and you're not doing resistance training. You're setting yourself up and, you know, the broken hip syndrome as we get older, your life expectancy goes down like a ship if you break a hip uh, after the age, I think it's 75, mm -hmm. something like that. So you want to be thinking about these things beforehand. So often we need a crisis yeah. to come to the attention of something that we didn't address for 10, 15, 20 years. And many of these things are not intuitive. Matt and I have spent our whole lives, we've got over 60 years of you know, experience dealing with this on a daily, daily basis. We took a genetic test and we're just like, oh man, I didn't know that about myself. Like, wow, look that. And then it's like, and then all of a sudden it's like a series of awareness comes in of like, oh, well, that's why I respond like right, that. Right, right. And that's the type of information that we want to elicit in people is that, oh, that's why I'm like that and my friend's not like this or my husband's like this or my spouse is like this or my kid is like this because there's unique aspects to all of us. And we all know that everybody's different, but how you're different is as important as that fact that you are different. Because if you don't know how you're different, you may be attracted to a philosophy which is the inversion of what you should be doing. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So again, we go back to everybody has to go ahead and get tested then and, and, and understand, personalize what you look like and, and what is serving you. And then maybe even having that aha moment like, oh, okay, now I understand why every time I go eat this at this healthy restaurant, quote unquote, I feel like shit. Mm -hmm. um, sugar, man, this is, we're over consuming sugar so much, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and we don't even know how it's hidden into, okay, here we go with the coffee. Now we go with this breakfast and now a little bit snack and now lunch without knowing the added sugars. And sometimes when we see it all together, it's crazy. But in your both opinion, with all that wisdom, over 60 years of wisdom here, is sugar really driving so much of dysfunction in our body and our genes and our gut everywhere? First of all, blood sugar, elevated blood sugar is, is extremely problematic. We know it ages us faster. Of course, if it's hyper elevated for too long can lead to diabetes. My mother-in-law lost both of her feet due to diabetes. So, you know, managing blood sugar is critical. Now here's a really simple hack. There's a great Instagram page called the glucose goddess. And she does these experiments where she eats the same meal, but with one version, she'll add, she'll eat the carbs, the fats, the fiber first, it has the carbs last. And always her blood sugar response is a lot more stable. So that's a great hack everybody can implement is if you're eating whatever what's on your plate, again, eat the fats, the carbs, sorry, the fats, the protein, the fiber first, eat the carbs last. Mm -hmm. So that's that'll help anyone. Second thing everybody can do is movement. Like just 10 minutes of brisk walking after a meal will help lower blood sugar by maybe 20 points. That's another, again, si simple thing. And actually micro movements throughout the day, like micro burst, there's a lot more research coming out showing how powerful it is. Because going from non-movement where our metabolism starts to slow down, right, to just sprinting up a, a, stair, a staircase, a massive difference mm. we know that going from sitting to standing is a massive difference it's about shifting and moving throughout the day and we're not talking about exercise we're just talking about just these micro bouts of, of movement have a massive impact on blood sugar and metabolism of course we have a product called blood sugar breakthrough mm -hmm. take two capsules an hour for or 20 minutes before your meal massive impact on blood sugar response so there's a lot of things people can do in general, is sugar bad? If you're eating too much sugar, yes, you can have that blood sugar roller coaster. But again, if you're doing the little tips and hacks we we're mm -hmm. talking about, it's not as problematic. And again, I'm a keto guy. And a lot of people in the keto movement have vilified sugar. Yeah. But it's not problematic if you're exercising, if you're moving, if you're eating it after your car, after your protein, your fats, et cetera. So all of those things have a massive impact on mm. 
overall blood sugar response. But I think monitoring your blood sugar levels is a really good idea for optimizing your health in general. Man, we, we don't even think about those small micro movements. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what does, is this the same thing as NEAT? So it's a little bit different. Again, there, there's some new studies where they, they do like a minute to four minutes of exercise. And it has a massive impact mm -hmm. on blood sugar response, metabolism, et cetera. Neat is, you know, again, throughout the day, whether it's, you know, walking the dog, et cetera. And again, going from sitting to standing, just you want to be moving at least every 30 minutes. Like a few years mm -hmm. ago, there was that whole sitting is the new smoking thing. Yeah, yeah. It's really not moving is the new smoking. Mm. So it doesn't matter if you're lying down, doesn't matter if you're actually standing, you want to be just moving again every 30 minutes because what happens in your body, your body starts kind of, I don't want to say shutting down, but down regulating a lot of things if you're not moving. And it's kind of like you sit on the couch and you feel good, you're relaxing, and then you're sitting on the couch for two hours and you don't feel good yeah, anymore. Yeah. Like, it's funny you're saying that. I'm just yeah. thinking about the last time I sat down and I'm like, Oh, I'm just gonna binge on like all these movies, and it's so hard for my body to like. It feels like it just freezes. Everything's downregulated. I'm sluggish. Mm -hmm. I realize I'm like brain fog. I realize I'm like just want to eat a bunch of carbs. It's crazy these signals in my body. It's it's gotten more dramatic as I got older, right? Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I could watch like and then get up and go work out, right? But now it's like sluggish, man. You know, it's wild. It's wild to to hear that. But I like the idea of, you know okay, we, we're on a call. Why don't we just batch that around and get on and walk around the block? Mm -hmm. You know, or do you, know, you see squats. the stairs. Yeah, do a squats. set of squats. What I used to do, I remember when I was in my residency, I had a, um, a, weight pull, up. a pull up bar, pull up bar, and I had it on the, the door. So every time I'd be working on the charts, you know, I'm like, oh, this one's the longest chart ever. I put it down for a moment. I do, I try to do 10 pull ups, 20 pull ups. I can, no, not 20, not 20. About 15, 10, 15. I got to be honest here. Uh, but, uh, it was really fantastic. It was like it just touching on it and doing these micro moves. I was in probably the best shape back then. And your energy just goes up 20, 30 percent. It does. Like that. Mm. It, it's, and that and that is a little formula for energy we, we don't even think of. We mm -hmm. can expend it, but w but instead of sitting and just being sluggish, it makes a massive change. There's so much in this book, and this is like three podcasts all together. But I would love to hear individually anything that you really wanted to cover that is so important. In, in the context of what we can find here on this book. Yeah, I want to start or wrap up by saying no matter what you're doing, no matter where you're at in your journey, don't let this book, this podcast, or whatever you're studying be overwhelming. Focus on three new habits, three new things. And it can be really simple. A lot of times, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed, especially, and we don't actually recommend anybody reads this from cover to cover. <laughs> Pick the chapter yeah, yeah. that's of interest to you right now, the thing that you're focused on, the thing that you're struggling with, and try to create one or two, maybe three new habits. And that's it. Try to establish these new habits, hardwire them. Because you know, we found from experience that all it takes is just you know, shifting one food, like upgrade your breakfast, right? Upgrade your dinner, upgrade your lunch. We talk about having just 12 winning meals. That's all you really need, right? And just by doing like one change at a time and you keep, you know, after a few weeks, a couple months when you feel ready, another new change. And next thing you know, you're compounding, you're stacking, you're gaining momentum. That's the journey. And it's still the journey for us. Like yeah. we're, we're constantly trying to upgrade. Okay, let's focus on this new thing, that new thing. I think it's easy to get overwhelmed and we really don't want anybody to... I can try to change or overhaul everything. Just a couple new things at a time and gain momentum, get traction, and then get to the next new thing. Awesome. Yeah. There are no evil foods, I think, is a really important takeaway from the book as well. In that we can vilify foods because of their overuse or abuse. But, I mean, we talk about sugar, for example. Who doesn't want birthday cake or ice cream or something at, at special occasions right. or, or so many so much social? And that goes back to the social, psychological, emotional aspect. We have a food pyramid in there that we talk about that people need to consider for long term health. But your spiritual and cultural components are really valuable and it's part of being a human. So recognizing maybe 
you know, I have friends who are Hindus who don't want to eat any meat no matter what, even if it might be better for their genetics. I have Islamic friends that they need to do their Ramadan every year. We have my Christian family and stuff who, you know, are into the Thanksgiving, into the Christmas, into the Easter and all the little treats that are around it and, and the typical methodology. You want to be able to go into those situations and not feel guilt, to feel that you can connect with your family and not be ostracized from it or feel them feeling ostracized for you because yeah. you are now the card carrying member of a diet cult and as part of that you have to condemn what everyone else is doing in order to validate or overcome your own uncertainty or to beat yourself up because you're either doing the right thing or the wrong thing and i feel so many people get caught in these psycho emotional traps where they start identifying so much with their diet cult that they lose the other aspects of the human. And I'm one of those people that, you know, you know, I was a guy that didn't eat butter for 15 years. I didn't have a piece of bread for 12 years. I was on a restricted diet. You know, if I didn't have veins in my abs, I was fat. I, I, I've done all that stuff. I, I've been on a raw food diet. I mean, talk about like isolate all your friends. So I know how many people struggle with that and feel bad about that or counter that and you see this this is my big attack or, or, or pet peeve I should say is that you know dietary experts condemning other diets or condemning other people to gain status and following and anchoring the Ten Commandments right. of their cult yeah. so that they can bolster their position only years later to come back and say, well, I didn't quite get it. Yeah, well, you know what? 10,000 people just have been tortured in their lives and ended up in a divorce mm -hmm. because of these food cult dynamics that made foods evil or foods good. Mm -hmm. And there's the right food at the right time for the right person. And when you're armed with this book, you're going to know exactly how to do that. You're going to be able to of steer away from diet cults and you're going to be steer towards the things that are right for you and not having that well it doesn't seem to work for me now you'll know why Ooh. listen we got the science we got the wisdom we got the mindset man we got the ultimate nutrition bible i want you to get this book put it in your kitchen put it in your library put it in the middle of your coffee table i don't care where you put it but I want you to be able to reach for this anytime you have a question about anything that has to do with your overall health. We talked about the holistic part. It's not just about food. It's everything. You get that in the book. Go get it. Thank you both. Thank you both. This was like so fantastic to have this conversation. Wade and Matt, the science behind it. We just wrapped it up and we got all that wisdom. And I can't wait to put this out to the world. Yeah, we have a special discount. It's ultimatenutritionsystem.com forward slash Dr. G. Perfect. And if people prefer watching video, I think we have this amazing video version of the book. It took us an entire week filming in Hollywood and video editors have been working there for months. Yeah. People can get the video course as well. So ultimate nutrition system.com forward slash Dr. Dr. G. G. We will put that in the show notes for all of you to click on and the video too. enjoy it. Thank you both for coming on here again. Wade, Matt, for the Great first time, you. we'll do it again soon. Thank you so much.